Hi, in the last few videos I'd like to tell you about further uh, theorems in relation to the central limit theorem. I'm not going to do the proofs of these, but it's uh, important to know about these things. Let x1, x2, and so on be iid with a finite, actually a zero mean, let's assume zero mean, and finite variance. The variance and the second moment are the same if the mean is zero. Okay, and then the central limit theorem tells us, as you all know by now, about this combination Sn minus the mean, but the mean is zero. Sn is as before the sum of the first n variables. The standard deviation of Sn, which is square root of n times sigma, uh, the probability that this is uh, smaller than a more than equal to a, should be close to phi of a. That's what the central limit theorem tells us, All right? So that these are close to each other. In fact, the left-hand side converges to the right-hand side as n goes to infinity for every given a. So now the Barry sn theorem states the following. It's telling about the error bound here, how far these two are from each other. So let me add here theorem. Very same. Let x i be i i d mean zero, so finite variance sigma square, and I'm also going to assume for this theorem that we have a finite third moment as well. So e of x cube is also finite. Okay. Uh, the theorem says that then. <coughs> then there exists a constant which doesn't depend on anything. It's just an absolute constant such that no matter what the distribution is, no matter what A is, the difference between these quantities is bounded in terms of the third moment of the x size and you have to divide by standard deviation cube and the square root of n. So that's the Barry SN theorem. This constant actually is known to be at most 0.8. So there are different versions of this theorem. The constant c, so this, this constant c, is known to be smaller than 0.8. It's also known to have a lower bound. It cannot be made smaller than 1 over root 2 pi in the version I know of. Uh, because if we, if we make it any smaller, then there are, uh, then the theorem will not hold for all distributions and all A's. Okay, so that's very SN theorem. If we have a finite third moment, then there is a bound on the difference between this kind of normalized probability and the limiting uh, standard normal distribution function in terms of the third moment of the variables. I'd like to show you an example to see how sharp these, these bounds are. They are usually not bound. This is a very general theorem. It works for every distribution, and as such, it's not expected to be particularly sharp. So let me show you a simple example that everybody can easily do. So let's do it here. Take a binomial random variable of parameters 10 and half. And of course, everybody knows that this is the same as the tenfold convolution of Bernoulli. One half, which is just a fancy way of saying that if I take 10 independent Bernoullis of parameter one half each, then this sum has this binomial distribution. Everybody knows that. So let's then calculate the probability that x is less than or equal to 6, which is not very far from the mean. The mean is, uh, so if x is, x has this distribution, right? The mean would be 10 times one half, which is 5. So x less than or equal to 6 is, is not, very far, not very far from the mean. And if somebody does the calculation, you can add up seven terms in the binomial mass function, or actually it's more efficient to do one minus this probability, which includes seven and eight, nine and 10. So that's only four terms, you can easily do that. And you end up with 0.0, oh, sorry, 8281, at least uh, four decimal places. And you can also ask about the probability 
that x minus the mean x minus the mean over root n which is root 10 times the standard deviation so let me just comment on this a little bit what is the uh, what is the mean and standard deviation of these Bernoullis? Bernoulli one half have e x one equals to one half and the variance of x one equals to p one minus p, so it's one half one minus one half, which is one fourth, and therefore the standard deviation is the square root of that. So that's one half. That's what we see here: the standard deviation and the n times the mean, which comes from 1 times the mean times n. Okay, so this is what exactly in the form of Sn minus mean over uh, square root n times sigma. So we want to ask then, what's the probability that I do the same with the 6? Okay, so from the 6 I subtract 5, then subtract 5 and divide by square root of 10 over 2, except that I want to make a continuity correction to make it a little bit more precise. So instead of 6, I'm going to use 6 and a half, then subtract 5 from there, divide by the same square root of 10 over 2. And so this is the same. These two are actually the same, right? I First I did 1 half here because x is integer, and then I just did some algebraic manipulations. Okay, so that's the true value. Now what is phi? So what would the central limit theorem say? If I would accept it for the tenfold convolution of Bernoulli's, it would say that I subtracted the mean, I divided by standard deviation, so this should behave like standard normal. So this should be close to uh, phi at exactly this number, 5.6 minus 5 over root 10 over 2. If you do the calculation, that's approximately uh, phi at 0.949. And you can look up the table, you end up with 0 0.03, uh, sorry, 08389. All right, so that's the true value. That's the central limit theorem approximation. They are not very far, okay? So they are pretty close to each other. Now, let's see what Barry Essien tell us about this case. Okay, so let's work out the very same bound. Let's work out this right hand side here, what the bound is, on the difference of these two. So you can see that the difference is pretty small, right? It's a, a little bit more than 1 over 100. The very same bound so one has to be a little bit careful because the very same theorem talks about mean zero random variables. Okay? The Bernoulli one-half is not mean zero. So let's subtract one-half from the Bernoulli's. So actually let's work with xi minus one-half instead of the original Bernoulli one-half. Okay, so these are mean zero. Um, e of xi minus one-half is zero. Okay, the variance is unchanged, so sigma is still one half. And what is the third moment um, of xi minus one half? Uh, why do we need that? Well, again, in the very same bound, we have the third absolute moment, so we need that here. And <coughs> the third absolute moment of this, what is that? So xi can be zero in which case this is one half cube, or it can be one in which case this is one half cube. So there is not much uh, to calculate here. In all cases, this is one half cube. Okay, and so the Berriessian bound, what we see on the right hand side of the Berriessian theorem, is that this constant, which is, we know it's smaller than 0.8, so the bound is actually smaller than 0.8 for the constant C, then, here's the constant c, then this 1 8 for the, or 1 half cube for the third moment, divide by, so this is a cube, divide by sigma cube, 
which is again one half cube and root n which is root of 10 because we have the tenfold convolution of these Bernoullis okay and if you calculate all of that it's quite easy to do the one half cube actually cancel the you just need to take square root of 10 and so on calculate it and you get approximately 0.25 that's the barrier same bound so the barrier same theorem tells us that the true probability and the central limit theorem approximation is not further apart than 0.25 in this case. The bound is true, they are quite close, actually much closer than 0.25. So usually the barrier sand bound is pretty weak. There are improvements on it, but as in this form, the, the, it's very general, but usually a very weak approximation.